Now, in my opinion, there are different kinds of creepy. You've got good old fashioned classic creepy, strange creepy, creepy creepy, but the most unsettling to me is friendly creepy. Something which at first glance looks fun, inviting, colourful, but then quickly you realise that things are off as though this initial friendliness is not what it seemed, and there's a darker story behind what you're looking at. The image then becomes unsettling as these two opposing feelings collide in your mind. A lot of images in this style feature things which we associate with happy childhood memories. A pool, a slide, that town playmat which every single kid owned at some point. But now the context is changed. These places and objects which once brought so much joy are now empty. They're fading away. So what does all of this have to do with don't hug me I'm scared? Well, it's easy to just grab a doll and put it in a dark scary room and say, look everyone, look how spooky it is, and then bosh millions of dollars. But what the new Don't Hug Me I'm Scared show has that makes it stand out is subtlety. Instead of looking like most horror movies, needing to constantly show you creepy house, creepy hallway, creepy creep, it appears bright and cheerful at first glance, taking the form of a children's puppet show. And then, the more you look, the more you watch, you begin to notice that, just like with these images, something is off. So I thought it'd be a bunch of fun to join these murder puppets and do a big old deep dive into the creepy horror fun that is Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Episode 2. Episode 2 is titled Death. And if you look at all of the episode titles, this one really stands out. The others could all easily pass as titles for episodes of children's puppet shows. Except for this one. And it tells you a lot about the structure of this episode compared to the others. In my previous video, I mentioned the usual Don't Hug Me I'm Scared formula. The trio are thrown into a scenario focusing on a particular aspect of life, often through a cheery song or dance. Things start off fairly innocent, but escalate until the true horror of what's happening comes through. But at the end of the day, they end up back home safe and sound, for the most part. And for every other episode, this is the case. But in episode 2, this darkness, which feels hidden most of the time, is apparent from the get-go, not just from the very first line. Well, I'm dead. But from the title. If the show started off with a subject matter like death, then I think it would be a bit too much right out the gate. So by easing in the violence in episode 1, it helps to build tension and adjust you to this world before episode 2 really dives in to the outright sinister feel that it holds. Just like last time, the episode begins with the trio sat in the house in silence. Yellow and Red stare off into the distance, while Stark sits in his rocking chair, enjoying the paper as usual, when he announces to the others in an almost boastful kind of way, Well, I'm dead. And by putting that little, well, in front of it, it's almost like this is no surprise to him. He's already accepted it. Actually, he's happy about it. We're so used to death being treated as this big, massive event. And it kind of is, it's finality. But in film, it's often accompanied by swelling music, hysteria, emotions run high. <laughs> no, please, please. So to have a fairly chill conversation about how he's dead, in such a calm scene, it's unexpected. How did you die? I forgot to drink water. Ha! In fact, in Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, death is almost seen as a celebration, with Red being annoyed that he's not dead. What does it say about me? Am I dead? Nope. Just well, me. Why do you get to... That's, it must be that's a mistake. Yeah. Showing this kind of emptiness that he feels, always seeming indifferent to everything. Duck calls him a jealous boy, gloating about his newly discovered death. It's possible that Duck sees death as being the talk of the town, and hasn't quite grasped the seriousness of it. I mean, it seems like none of them really do. They don't seem to grasp that he'll be gone forever. Red tells him that he doesn't even know what death is, to which Duck replies, As far back as I can remember, I always knew I deserved to be dead. A very morbid thing to say. Not just, oh, I wanted to be dead, which would be sad enough, no, I deserve to be dead. It makes you question this little Ducky's past and the things that he's seen and done. You see, there's subtle hints throughout the show that Duck was once in the military, and so him saying he deserves to be dead could be some form of survivor's guilt he feels. But how can Duck be dead? He sat right there. Well, 
The paper says it happened, so it must be true. Although dead people don't usually talk or read newspapers or hang with friends. But, like I said, death works a little differently here it seems. As Duck stands up to get drippy in his Sunday best, we hear a thud of something hitting the floor. And, as he looks down, whoopsie, his heart lays there, surrounded by a small puddle of blood. Despite there being no blood on him or a hole in his chest, sinister music begins to build as the heart rolls over and over towards the middle of the room, getting stuck to the floorboards on the way, having to peel itself off like Velcro each time it turns over. Is that an egg? As though it's got a mind of its own. And then, all of a sudden, it comes to a stop, the puddle of blood growing as the heart dissolves, spreading over the wooden floorboards. The music gets louder, building and building as the floor shakes around the blood. We cut to a side angle, as two grotesque, thin strings of blood resembling arms come from beneath the floor. Whatever it is, it's pulling itself up into their living room. The bloody floorboards distort and warp, creaking as we get close-ups of something being created, pulling itself together from what was once Duck's heart. The music continues to build before stopping suddenly, and a sentient coffin rises up. Hi! You have all this build-up of tension about what horrors this thing is going to turn into, and then, when it appears, it's just another soft smiling puppet, nowhere near as monstrous as the camera work, music, and circumstances of his creation would imply. But he is still unsettling to look at, because of what he is, a friendly puppet of a coffin, something which holds such a dark meaning, used to transport bodies surrounded by grieving friends and family. I believe this coffin man is some kind of version of the Grim Reaper, a deity which comes to help souls who have recently died pass over and accept their fate. But for now, we'll call him Mr. Coffin. And Mr. Coffin talks in such a soft way. Hey, don't worry, just a bit of small talk to lighten the mood. And this sort of soft speaking is common when people are trying to comfort someone who's grieving, to show that they're feeling low too. It's a sign of respect, like you're trying to make them feel calmer by talking calm. And it's not just his voice. This coffin fella acts pretty friendly too, complimenting their home and giving a lovely gift to Duck. A wreath. Right out the gate, he plays a little guessing game of which one is the dead one. Now, which one of you is dead? Oh, that would be- Wait! Don't tell me. I'm good at this. Almost as though he's toying with them. This is all fun and games to him. He guesses yellow. But we know that Duck is supposedly the dead one here. By making this coffin fella, who seems as though he's some kind of authority on death in this universe, be in the dark over who is dead, it in turn makes the viewer hesitant to believe that Duck is really deceased. I mean, our only source has been a newspaper, not exactly the most reliable, concrete evidence. This coffin, just like the trio, just sort of accepts it and goes along with it. And again, Red really wants to be the dead one. It's just him, is it? Because I feel like I could maybe be dead. Yeah, I bet you do, but I've only got one down here. And his phrasing makes it seem as though he's been sent here by some kind of external force and his goal is to make sure that someone is dead and buried by the end of the day. It's his purpose. Red runs over to his ID card, and it confirms that, unfortunately, he is in fact alive. But it does offer to tell him all about his identity, who you are. No. But Red is having none of it. As usual, he's disinterested. That the viewers want to know who these guys are, and they purposefully leave it very vague, not telling us their names even. So when we finally have the chance to find out some information about Red's identity, it's frustrating to see him walk away, but he doesn't care about his identity, probably because he doesn't really seem to have one. Red is disinterested in everything. And I would really prefer to do as little as possible or nothing at all. Red walking away is also a hint towards the viewer that if you want answers about who these fellas are, it's not going to be easy or straightforward by any means. And it's likely that there never will be a concrete answer, just speculation and theories with help from the few clues that we do get throughout the show. Because the trio have little money, likely because they left Petersons and Sons and Friends Bits and Parts Limited. The workplace from the previous episode, bloody slackers. But no time to worry about the budget funeral because it's time for another jolly old song. All about how we gotta get things ready for the big day, big day. We gotta get things ready for the special day. 
and this song works great as both comedy and horror. A cheery song all about getting ready for a funeral. And it's catchy too, it got stuck in my head for days, which when you think about the topic being getting ready to bury your friend probably isn't a good thing. <laughs> It's so upbeat, with the lyrics at the bottom of the screen changing colour as they sing them, with a little icon of duck bouncing between the words. As though it's a sing-along at home, folks. And if you look closely, you'll see that this icon of duck quickly switches to a skull. It's the only visual reminder throughout the whole song of what the actual subject matter is, death. And just like with every Don't Hug Me I'm Scared tune, it starts off innocent enough before horror and gore start to seep through beginning with Red brushing his teeth, and we get our only look throughout the whole series at what lies beneath Red's mop. Mmm, look at those lovely gnashes. Just like with the show as a whole, underneath Red's soft exterior is something more off-putting, a set of rotting, crooked teeth, surrounded by bleeding gums, which looks far more realistic than the rest of his design. It creates this disturbing contrast of hard bone and soft felt. The song gets more and more off the rails, as the trio start doing things which have nothing to do with funerals, such as laying out treats, doing some cooking, and even putting colourful cards into envelopes. If you play this song on mute, it looks as though they are preparing for a party, with all of the bright colours and patterns and it's yet another sign that the trio have no idea what death really is. It turns out that Yellow and Red have gotten confused about what the big day is all about, and are now focused on grabbing a big old pile of organs and making a shepherd's pie. We gotta get things ready for the shepherd's pie, day. Uh -huh. what? what are we doing? Oh no, it's the funeral, it's the funeral, sorry. But we don't see the animal that they get this meat from. It's likely that these are the same organs which Duck tells them he had removed in the very next scene. So, now that we've gotten everything ready for the big day, it's time for the big day. And we cut to the trio in a graveyard. This is the first time we've seen the trio outside, and it's in one of the most morbid locations possible. But it still doesn't lose that bright, colourful aesthetic. Not yet anyway. Funeral scenes in television often are accompanied by rain and have a darker, often grey look as a visual show of how everyone's feeling. And Don't Hug Me I'm Scared is doing the same thing using colour to show how they feel. It's just, they don't feel bad, because they haven't processed that Duck's leaving yet. And I mean, why would they? Duck is sat right there in the coffin, talking to them. Look, I had my insides removed. And we see that he's now inside Mr. Coffin, as though he's being consumed. But Duck is still optimistic and jolly throughout this whole process, greeting the others in a friendly way when they arrive. Hey guys. You all right? Hello. Thanks for coming. And as always, Red seems disinterested. I'm your best friend, I don't Yeah, even... we're close. I mean, I know you, I know which one you are. More lifeless than Duck is, and he's the one who's supposedly dead. As Duck tries to converse with the others, Coffin scolds him. Hey, hey, no talking. Remember, you're dead. Oh, sorry. Again, being a Coffin, it's his job to make sure that Duck stays in line and acts still and lifeless, the way that we all know dying to really be. But the way that he says this is as though he's the teacher here and how to die properly is the lesson. Just behind Duck is a gravestone, and on this gravestone is written a name, David. At first, this is a big deal because we never find out any of the trio's names. I mean, that's why I've been saying Yellow, Red and Duck this whole time. So, have we finally learnt one of the characters' names? Well, no. Duck explains that the stone's name is David. He's David. What? That's supposed to be your name. What's his name? There was some miscommunication between him and Mr. Coffin, but it's too late to change it now. Now, this at first seems like a misdirect, but there's strong evidence that Yellow is actually named David. He has a big D on his overalls. And if you remember Mr. Coffin's funny little game of Guess Who's Dead, he initially thought it was Yellow. It's not quite clear, and there's no concrete answer. At least not at this point in the series anyway. Back to Duck and his ruined, inaccurate tombstone. Change it to my name then. Well, I can't now. It's already engraved. I can't unchisel it, can I? Why not? His misunderstanding of how death works is beginning to annoy the Coffin Man, and it's only going to get worse. Mr. Coffin then asks the kind of question that you might hear at a wedding. If anyone knows any reason why this person should not be dead, say now or he will forever be dead. As though Yellow and Red hold the power to just allow him back from being dead. And it's up to them to plead for his life. Yellow clearly has something to say about all this, but due to his constant confusion and trouble expressing himself, he is unable to get it out in time. 
Uh, but isn't he? Huh? I think he does. He can't put it into words, but he doesn't want Duck to be dead. He likes things the way they are. It's the same way that a young child might react to losing a loved one before they're old enough to grasp all these concepts like death and grief. And Red, being as passive and indifferent as always, says nothing. And so, after waiting just a few seconds, they miss their window, and Coffin moves on from the question, showing us a lovely little slideshow of Duck's best moments, back in the workplace, as well as flying a military plane, to which Yellow says, But he didn't farewell do any of that. It makes me think of how, when someone dies, their funerals often glaze over the flawed parts of them, instead offering up this image that whoever passed was a perfect fella, no matter what. And of course, this is how it works, because when you're remembering a loved one, you want to think of the better times, but this often ends up painting an inaccurate image of them, and this is likely what's happening to Duck now. He's presented as a friendly, hard-working old chap. And this slideshow has a generic voiceover, which repeats Goodbye. Goodbye to you. With what sounds like elevator music in the background. It makes it sound as mundane as possible, almost as though it's an artificial, pre-recorded message with zero personality, containing absolutely nothing specific to Duck. Just another way of showing how ingenuine Duck's service seems. The slideshow even ends with goodbye David. We then get a close-up of Coffin, who tells the trio, I mean duo, it's time to go home. And when we zoom back out, Duck has gotten up and is standing with the others, waving goodbye. Clearly, Duck still hasn't grasped the situation, doing what he's told by this mysterious Coffin entity, who really, he's only just met. He skips right past the first four stages of grief and just goes straight to acceptance. See you later, floorboard person. <laughs> Not you, cheeky. You're dead. Now get back in here. The way he says this is similar to how a teacher might react to a student giving a humorous answer in class. He gets back in the coffin without complaining before we're shown a point of view shot of him being lowered into the ground and Mr. Coffin slamming shut. Doug is now officially dead and buried. Red and Yellow are now back in the living room, and the room is darker than before. It helps to set the mood and show that Yellow is still mourning. It's quite literally all a bit more dim now that Duck isn't around. At the funeral, it was bright and cheery, because in a way, he was still there, with the only evidence of him being dead at that moment being Mr. Coffin's description. He still acted alive and talked with the other two, and at least then there was sad organ music. Now it's almost silent, except for a quiet ticking of the clock, making it feel even more empty. But Red breaks this silence. Huh. I guess it's just gonna be me and you now. Yeah. Until the other guy comes back. Duck has been buried, but Yellow still doesn't understand that he's gone for good. He's struggling to accept this new reality. Actually, I don't know if he is gonna come back. I think he just sort of stays in the hole. And you can see the moment that Yellow begins to realise Doug is gone for good. Which is impressive because his face never changes expression throughout the show. So the puppeteer instead adjusted his head and arms into a kind of slump, moving extremely slow, as though he is low energy. Red notices that Yellow is upset and tries to cheer him up, doing a pretty awful job. It's, it's not that bad. We didn't really like him anyway. Remember how he used to bite you? Yeah. Like that. Even though Duck caused Yellow pain at times, he still misses him, because they've spent so much time together. They never really leave the house unless guided by one of these talking objects, and so it's not so much that they're a close family, but a close set of prisoners sharing a cell. And despite his flaws, Yellow misses the company. A noise can be heard from the kitchen, and the two investigate. Opening the door, and the usual overwhelming brightness of the kitchen has been replaced with darkness. And standing in this darkness is a whole group of these things, which have grey skin, grey hair, and black funeral suits. All of them have an exaggerated, sad expression on their face, and their dark grey skin and clothing makes them almost blend into the background. And whilst all of them look pretty unsettling, the scariest one, in my opinion, is this dude back here, sat on the chair under the archway which leads to the door, staring forward into space, perfectly still. He's blocking the way out, 
and sat far from the others. Naturally, Red and Yellow are confused as to who this group is, and a sentient tissue claims they are all friends of David which, again, isn't his name, and it's no accident that the tissue is the only one of them who talks. The others have no names, no voices, and all look nearly identical. It makes it look as though the duo are in a sea of strangers. You didn't even know him. Who really did? Unfortunately, sometimes when you go to a funeral, you might find people there who don't even really know the person being buried, and yet here they are, grieving, sobbing, over someone they might not have even met, let alone had a decent conversation with. One of the grey suited fellas hands over a gift to Red, which is wrapped like a birthday present, with bright colours and nice patterns. And as he looks inside it, well what a lovely gift, a make a new friend kit. Oh boy do I need one of those. But before Red can even look up to thank them, they're gone, leaving no trace, and the brightness of the room goes back to how it usually is, making it overwhelmingly colourful. It's as though the house itself is telling them, Look, the funeral's over, stop being sad you, get back to how it was, can't be upset all bloody day. And the quiet music again changes to silence. Uh. When grieving, many say that the worst period is after the funeral, because now all their loved ones are gone, and the whole process is kind of over in an official sense. The duo then sit at the kitchen table with their new make a friend gift, and have a look through all the options of pre-made mates each with their own catchphrase. Comes with her own debt. Kiki, credit card debt. Already in loads of debt. <sighs> it's almost like they're flicking through a catalogue, trying to pick out a new bit of furniture. Rather than having a proper period of time to grieve, instantly they've been guided towards the path of just replace Duck with someone else. And Red seems more than fine to get a new third member in. She seems fun. Mm. Says she's a classic. He didn't really like how things were anyway, but Every time he suggests one of the pre-made people, Yellow rejects each one. Fudge. That can't be right. I like fudge. Oh, he's too opinionated. Getting angry and throwing the kit off the table, saying how he wants the old one back. Red gives in, and for a second, it seems as though he may miss Duck more than he lets on, and it looks as though we're going to get another lovely song all about mourning. But before he can even spit any hard bars, a ball of clay, which fell out of the Make a Friend kit, speaks up. It's become alive. <laughs> it then begins to talk to the duo, having a bit of an existential crisis, trying to figure out what it is. Oh, I am whole. It was supposed to be a pre-designed person out of the book, but they didn't choose one, and so it's sort of a clean slate. Just like clay, it's ready to be moulded into a person. Something. Oh, Something. what's it doing? Something. Just mucking around. It might even be a blend of every personality in the book, and therefore its personality can go in any direction it likes, taking bits and parts from the different options. And every time this pink thingy is on screen, we get some really impressive claymation, especially through its design, which is always morphing and changing, as though it's growing before our eyes, trying to settle on a final form. And the same thing goes for its voice, changing pitch and tone mid-sentence, like it can't decide what it should sound like. Hello, Stain. That's a funny word. Maybe I could be called Stain. Like me, it's still figuring itself out. And just like that, we have a new third member, everybody. Woo! Move aside, Duck. It's time for pink clay thing now. At least, that's how Red sees it, setting off the intro that we love so much into motion. But instead of Duck, now it's Pinky, and Yellow keeps jumping into frame, trying to stop the intro from happening. It's clear he is not happy with this replacement. He wants the old one back. Shame he's dead. But what's this? Even though Duck is buried, we're not done following him yet. We cut to the graveyard, and that same bell which dung, dinged, dung, when the coffin closed, continues playing, and the pitch of the bell, just like the camera, goes down, giving us a side view perspective as we travel under the graveyard all the way down to duck inside the coffin. The way he's framed here is great. He's boxed in, trapped. We've been told he's dead, but he's still active and talking. So to us, it's as though he's been buried alive. And this is probably the darkest the episode has been so far. But what's this? There's a light bulb in his coffin, 
or should I say Mr. Coffin? Because remember, he's also down here with Dark. And the way his face is positioned on the coffin means that the two of them are looking eye to eye. Meaning we can have extreme close-ups of the two which also act as point of views. This entire shot is Coffin's face, and it makes you understand the claustrophobia that Duck should feel even more. As wanting to get out of a buried coffin is bad enough, but when there's a death-like deity staring down at you inches from your face, it makes you want to escape even more. Despite being isolated, six feet under, he's always got eyes on him down here, and because Coffin can't blink due to his design, it makes him appear even more menacing, like he's always watching. He tells Duck it's time for him to go, as there's a lot of paperwork which comes with death. Again, making it sound like he does this a lot. It's not personal to him, it's just another death, another funeral. And you can't blame him really, someone has to deal with the dead. But as he tries to go away, his eyes rolling into the back of his head as though he's leaving this form and going to another, he tells Duck he can press a buzzer if he needs anything. This is a big mistake as Duck gets bored very quickly, and just moments after Coffin leaves, he pulls him back, asking meaningless questions and pressing the buzzer when he's still there. He asks Coffin if he wants to play a game like snooker or beach volleyball, two things which you need to go to specific locations to play, locations which aren't this Coffin six feet under. It's a subtle way of showing Duck wants to leave, and he's not going to do well trapped down here. He's like an excited little kid, with his thoughts racing, going from topic to topic like rapid fire. But Mr. Coffin is the opposite, calm, relaxed. And a coffin is designed to keep dead bodies in, and his annoyance with Duck not being a model dead guy is continuing to grow. What if I need the toilet? You won't need the toilet. I drank a milkshake during the service. Well, you shouldn't really have done that. And it's going to get worse because as time passes, Duck continues to press the buzzer and starts wrecking the coffin carving lines into it like it's a middle school desk, and even weeing all over it. Dirty bugger. I'm dead. Yes, and you're terrible at it! His voice, which is usually so calm and controlled, Oh, you've got one of those! is growing louder and more annoyed by the second. Mr. Coffin is now so fed up, he tells Duck he's leaving for good, and now he is all on his own. We cut back to the new trio, as Red shows a cheerful pinky all around the crib and Pink's optimism is already clashing with the other two, who are fairly down. Wow, and we go outside, right? And we see the world, and we go on adventures! Uh, do we? With yellow still morning, and red just kind of generally like this, Pinky sits in the only chair available, which of course is Duck's rocking chair. Yellow does not like this. Hey, but that's his chair! Feeling as though they're replacing Duck already, which in fairness, they kind of are. Everything Pink says, Yellow has an issue with. You're not supposed to say that kind of stuff. Because none of it is anything that Duck would be caught saying. But Pink just ignores him. She represents a hopeful young child. She was literally born just minutes ago, bursting into a hopeful song all about how life is just so exciting and wonderful. I wanna thank you for this opportunity. And this is the first and only time in the show that one of the trio is the one to start a song, rather than them being thrown into it. It's a great way of showing a possible shift in the show's formula if Pink is to stay around. You see, Pink is optimistic and still innocent. She hasn't had time to learn that this is sort of a prison. We mainly go in here or sometimes we go in there. She wants to do all of this amazing stuff out there, but halfway through her hopeful song, they cut her off. Stop it! Saying that that's not the kind of thing they do. As sad as it is, being hopeful and having ambition is not one of the lead trio's traits. They then begin to impose their views on her. Should I do it again? No, just, just sit here and stuff will happen. Something normally happens. Expecting her to act like Duck does, and laying down more and more rules, which don't make a lot of sense. You're supposed to say that the floor is too loud, or the window is disrespecting you. Why would I say that? Especially as Red has been saying throughout the episode how little he cared for Duck. Except now, piece by piece, he wants to turn this new member into Duck. We then get a song from Yellow and Red all about the wonderful things that are memories and none of the memories they have of Duck are actually good memories. We see Duck laughing at Yellow in pain, saying how he'd never get into the military far too weak. During this song, we see brief clips of Red making adjustments to Pink, making her look and act more and more like Duck, 
giving her his iconic coat and putting a beak onto her. It's not just her actions which Red wants to change, it's her appearance too. He wants Pink to be indistinguishable from Duck. Yellow's memories during this song are all of Duck in the past, before they begin bleeding into what Yellow is currently doing, grabbing a winter coat and going to Duck's grave. As he approaches, the song's melody fades out, and Yellow's voice becomes more shaky. Memories of me finding the shovel. It's no longer following the rhythm, as though this song about memories isn't enough for him. The more he remembers, the more he wants the old one back, and he's gonna do whatever it takes. He begins to dig. This is Yellow's darkest moment, and his appearance, which is usually so bright and vibrant, has been completely drowned out by the night sky, making him appear like a silhouette. We're seeing Yellow balance this fine line between how past memories of loved ones can turn from nostalgic to devastating. What started off as happy memories are now corrupted because all you can think about is how much you miss them. We then catch up with Duck and Mr. Coffin. Duck is rambling and rambling about his memories listing every single thing he's done in his life off like a shopping list. This drives Mr. Coffin to insanity. I can't do this anymore! And as he reaches his breaking point, he breaks, literally. Yellow's shovel bursts through Mr. Coffin's face, likely killing him in the process. We then cut to black. Has Yellow saved our good old pal Duck? We then see Red, sitting with Duck as he reads the paper, like he always does. Hey, Duck's back. But wait a second, this isn't old Duck, this is Pink, changed so much by Red that the two are now indistinguishable. At this moment though, Yellow and old Duck enter. Uh oh, now there's two. You see, Red and Yellow represent two different forms of grief. Red had a chance of making a new friend, but instead, he takes this optimistic, friendly bit of clay and literally moulds it, like clay, piece by piece, into just an identical replica of what he used to have, but hurting Pink in the process, turning her into the complete opposite of what she once was. Whereas Yellow, on the other hand, can't stand the new third fella, and the optimism it brings, missing Duck so much that he digs up his body and brings him back to the house. He's in denial and can't accept reality, both of which are as bad as each other. But the real problem is what to do now. There's two duckies, Will the show go on with both from now on? Well, of course. Well, now there's four of us. We go into yet another version of the intro. This time, the difference being a change in the lyrics. There's four of us, just four of us. How wholesome. But before the intro can end, one of the duck's heads is sliced clean off, and the other duck stands there holding the shovel. Actually, no. Four doesn't work. There's three of us. But which duck killed which? From where the characters were standing at the beginning of the song, it seems like the old duck was killed. However, it's not exactly certain as there's a good 15 seconds or so in between the two shots. But if this is the new duck, it adds new context to the rest of the show. But seeing as they're identical, it doesn't affect the plot, but it still makes you think. Is this the original or the replica? This episode is a great look into grief and the different ways it can affect us. We get a look at the different stages of burial and loss. A large portion of this episode plays out like how a parent might explain to a child how their loved one won't be coming back, but in a friendlier way. Don't be scared, the coffin's friendly. Don't be scared, you'll still be able to see your pal at the funeral. In fact, he's the lucky one. He's going to a better place. It's just, in this case, that better place seems to be a lie. We never find out what Mr. Coffin really is, but does it really matter? It makes us relate to the trio's feelings even more, as we ourselves don't know what happens when we die. But I hope if a sentient, passive-aggressive coffin man does come to collect my soul, he does a better job than this old chap. Even though I love it when the show appears friendly at first before diving into that darkness, it's fascinating to see how this episode shakes up the formula a little. There's not really a clear villain in this episode. I mean, you could even argue that it's yellow, killing this death-like coffin who really is just doing his job, all because he can't let his friend go. 
a natural part of life. And thank you so much for 2.7 thousand subscribers. That is honestly crazy. I can't even count that high. So that's honestly amazing to see. Like I'd never thought I'd be at this point. Also, if you like any of the artwork behind me, uh, it's all my own and I've made an Instagram for my YouTube and my artwork. So if you want to see any more kooky, crazy drawings uh, like this, 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 it's water wavy. And yes, I know four wise. Look, I'm not trying to smash water wave was taken. I promise. I'm not trying to smash. Also, quick side note, I'm going to be doing a video on every single episode of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, so subscribe and hit the bell if you don't want to miss them. Thank you, I love you, goodbye.